Welcome back, everybody. What's up, Steven? What's up, Eddie? <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Movie Boss Podcast, the strongest podcast in the world about movies. I am, as always, your friendly neighborhood host, Ron Jam, joined by the ever-present El Tigre. And you are in for a treat, as this is the only podcast in the entire world filmed entirely inside an active volcano. And let me tell you this, true believers, it is hot. It is very hot. Other than that, though, how's it going, Tyler? I'm excited to podcast today. I think we have some good topics and some random ass stuff brought to you by Ronald. (laughs) Hilarious, my man. Hilarious. Uh, You always bring the zingers. You always bring them. Of course I do. Uh, Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and leave the segments today. Tyler sounds a little tired. Um, So (laughs) let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about today in movie news, we're sticking just to movie news, real life news. (laughs) Real life news is fucking depressing. Um, and so I want to make this episode, uh, because real life is depressing and it mostly sucks ass. So this should be an escape for me, for you and for anybody who tunes in. <laughs> anyway, so our first bit of news is the hotly anticipated Thor four love and thunder has dropped a trailer. Uh, we see a little bit of the story this go round. We see Thor's rock and bod, um, The guy looks absolutely sauced to the gills. He's geared out of his tree, and he looks phenomenal. Uh, I just want to, as a fitness podcast, take a moment to, I want to take a moment to to talk about the unattainable nature of his physique. Um, If you see his body and think, you know, I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to download the CenterFit app, and I'm going to (laughs) eat fucking green smoothies and and big raw steaks or whatever the hell, you know, is popular. Uh, the fad diets in muscle and fitness, or sorry, in men's health these days, uh, you're, it's not going to work, okay? Um, Chris Hemsworth, I like him as an actor, like him as a performer. He seems like a perfectly amicable gentleman, but I don't like center fit. I do think it's a bit of uh, misleading practices to show his freaking sauced up, jacked body <laughs> as the advertisement and say, oh, you can get like this if you do this exercise. You're not going to fucking get to be 6'4", 226", eight nine percent body fat dehydrated and peeled and shredded and looking juicy as a fucking tangerine on a summer's day by doing burpees okay you got to sauce up you got to lift big you got to eat right uh and that's not saying they're not downing his work to get that physique i'm just saying that's the biggest takeaway from the thor trailer is you're not going to look like thor unless you're ready to get pinned up but I did enjoy the tone of the film. It looks fun. I love Taika Waititi and all his directorial efforts. Uh, I do wish Gore the God would Butcher. have, um, you know, more of a design. I understand, you know, you get Christian Bale. You don't want to hide that very emotive face under tons of makeup. And I'm sure they're probably worried about if they stuck closer to the comic design, it would look a little bit like um, the one Squidward looking motherfucker from um, Infinity War. That guy? Anyway, because in the comic books, Gore is noseless, uh, stark white, a little bit of black detailing, and he has two big head fins, head tails that come off uh, kind of his temples. All of that's removed. He now kind of looks like if Drax um, was emaciated and turned white instead of his pale gray color. But uh, obviously, Christian Bale is going to kill it, and I understand the uh, the idea there to not make him look like other villains or other characters they've had and not to hide Christian Bale's face. Anyway, that's my takeaways from the Thor trailer. I think it comes out in July. Looking forward to it. We'll, we will definitely cover it. Right, Tyler? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I'm no. Trailers Tyler. I know you're excited for this one. The Mission Impossible 7 Dead Reckoning Part 1 trailer dropped. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the big takeaways I noticed is they're not really giving too much away. They're focusing on, you know, check out the action. Uh, and obviously, that's what people go to it for. I really enjoy this film series. I think it's well written, well acted. It's really good. It's just great action. But, you know, we're not going there because it's going to be this life changing emotional experience. You want to see Tom Cruise put himself in danger and then kill some bad guys. And it definitely mm-hmm. does that. <laughs> I do love the self-aware nature that there's a a bit in the trailer where it just cuts to just him fucking sprinting his his 60-year-old balls off. Uh, and it looks awesome. Mm-hmm. It ends with him riding a motorcycle off of a cliff that he then low-altitude base jumps from the motorcycle falling off the cliff. It looks excellent. I'm sure, it's going to be a great time, and I'm very excited to see this one. And its sequel, Dead Reckoning Part 2. All right, the last big trailer we're going to talk about is Disney Plus's She-Hulk. Um... I got to say, the tone of the show looks fun. It looks like Allie McBeal with superpowers. Now, I didn't watch Allie McBeal because I'm not 60. 
Um, but I've heard it's good. I know RDJ is on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it does look like a fun kind of rom-com procedural. Like, it's something different. I, I talk about this a lot on here. And I love superhero stuff. I love sci-fi. I love comic books. But the reason it's all fun in comic books is because they have the freedom, the willingness to just go nuts. And everything is different. And there's lots of, of big swings here. So it's nice to see them trying out different avenues and just trying different stuff. It doesn't all have to work. I mean, it's fucking Disney. They have a trillion dollars. If this one tanks, who cares? Obviously, the actors and the crew, they wanted to do well. That's not my point. But it's good that they're taking these chances and doing something different. And I'm looking forward to it. Now, as all things do, this comes with a bit of controversy. Now, uh, some of the She-Hulk render and the CGI looks a little gummy. Um, I know it's been chalked up to you know low res on YouTube and stuff. But I, Disney saw that coming. I think what it really comes down to um, is the Hulk render looks pretty good. It looks about the same as it has in the, the previous films. Although I do think they're trying to desaturate his green a little bit. And I, I don't really love the way the smart Hulk looks, at least in what I've seen so far, um, because I think they've lost a lot of the hulkiness. And I know that's kind of the point, but in the comic books, the Professor Hulk is still very much, you know, the big Hulk, uh, just not as big. So I hope I hope what I've seen is just kind of a weird clip. But anyway, the controversy with She-Hulk is that, you know, the CGI, for lack of a better word, it doesn't look great. Um, But I think the, as I was alluding to a second ago, the issue is Hulk has to look like Mark Ruffalo, yes. Thanos has to resemble Josh Brolin, yes. But they are intended to look inhuman. They are intended to look larger than life. They are intended to look intimidating. That's an entirely different thing than having them look hot. (laughs) And you can tell they were going for hot with She-Hulk. I think Tatiana Maslany, the the actress who plays She-Hulk, she's she's a good-looking woman, obviously. She's a professional actor. She doesn't do this by accident. She's good-looking. And they went to accentuate all of her features and try to make them even more so, kind of in the way that Hulk becomes more brutish-looking version of, of Mark Ruffalo's face. Um, And I think that's where this uncanny valley gets really deep. It's one thing to make them less human and less appealing, let's say. But it's another thing to take this person's face and then try to kind of texture map it onto this much larger head with this, you know, they gave her really, uh, Tatiana Maslany has like kind of tighter curly hair. And then She-Hulk has like this 1950s vixen, like big barrel curl, like not barrel curl, big, like beautiful curl, well-styled, like. Um, diva hair and the, they try to make you know accentuate all of her good features and make her even more beautiful and I think that's where it gets kind of jarring for people because it doesn't quite click um, and then the subsurface scattering on the skin looks a little weird like it looks a little bit um, lack of detail subsurface scattering is what happens when light enters our skin you know because our skin is not fully opaque so light enters our skin and bounce around bounces around all the structures underneath and then it's kind of um passes back out so that's the subsurface scattering mm-hmm. you'll notice that if you put your hand in front of like a mirror like i'm doing right i'm sorry if you put your hand in front of a window like i'm doing right now you'll notice the edges of your fingers are kind of illuminated as the light goes through where it's thinner and this character seemed to be missing some of that like her s- surface of her skin was very flat it's almost like they wanted to have her have like a full beat of makeup look when she she hulked so it it smooths it out but in a way that's completely unnatural because did, did she go buy green foundation Hmm? Hmm? Mm-hmm. I'll wait. Disney, email me. <laughs> you know what it is. Yahoo.com. Email me. Tell me. <laughs> cut that. Cut that email part. I don't want my personal email out there. Fuck. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the other thing that I saw people um, being upset about, and it kind of bugged me too, is, you know, the She-Hulk model, they made her hot. She's banging. They even mentioned it. They're like, oh, your body is out of control, girl. But she Hulk's supposed to be very muscular, and she is quite. She does look muscular, you know. She's defined. She's muscular, but it's almost more along the lines of a like a figure competitor who's off season, where it's a little softer. And I guess one of the artists was saying that Disney kept mandating that they make her less and less muscular. So it's kind of a weird middle ground they went with. And uh, I think you'll have to wait till the show comes out to really see how it pans out. But anyway, that's my two cents, Tyler. What do you have to say about it? <laughs> so. 
This one, oh man, I just feel, I even feel, no, I don't feel bad. Hilarious, man. All right, now, this is a big piece of news for me personally. I've discussed this character before. I've discussed what it means to me. And, and that, that is the first set pick for Angel Manuel Soto's Blue Beetle. Blue Beetle starring Shola Maridueña, and he is kind of like a Batman Beyond, Venom, Spider-Man amalgam type character uh, in the DC universe. And the reason it's so important to me is because it is the first Latino superhero who is playing a Latino superhero who is cast as a Mexican kid playing a Mexican kid. It's directed by a Puerto Rican man. It's shot in Puerto Rico. Most of the cast is Latino. And it's just cool. It's it's something I've literally waited. Hmm, let's see, I'm 30 years old. I've waited 30 fucking years for, um, and it didn't happen before that. So it's super cool. And the, the the suit looks, I mean, it's beautiful. It couldn't be more comic accurate in the best way. Um, go look it up right now. I'll wait. It looks amazing. Um, I'm sure the proportions will even be tightened up and enhanced a little bit in post because the helmet is a little bit oversized for the body, but it's because you had to fit a real person's head in there. Um, but it looks beautiful. I'm so excited for this movie. Uh, my only regret, the only thing I hate about this movie is that uh, your boy ain't in it, <laughs> but I'm super stoked. Um, check out that Blue Beetle set pick. I cannot wait. I will be covering this movie in so much depth. I can't wait to go see it. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's a movie about Guess what? They did it. They did it again. They did another movie about an old white guy. Yes, the Elvis movie's coming out soon. Why are they doing this? I don't know. Are they going to cover the fact that he stole all his music from black people? Probably not. Are they going to cover? Mm-hmm. Are they going to cover the fact that he married <laughs> what's her name when she was like, "Hold on, fuck, I'm going to Google it." <laughs> are they going to cover the fact that he fucking met? Priscilla Presley when she was 14 years old and they got married when she was 16. Are they going to cover that? Probably not. They're going to make him look like a fucking rad ass dude. There's going to be a resurgence in his catalog sales and everyone's going to clap and dance and be merry and he's going to get even more shine than he's had because people started to forget about him. They're bringing him back, baby. That's what we need. My biggest question about this, besides the whole you know theft and um, you know underage girl thing, is that why the fuck are they doing this? Has anybody seen Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story? It is a farcical, fictitious um, music biopic starring um, starring John C. Riley, Jenna Fisher, Tim Meadows, and Kristen Wiig from 2007. And it basically sends up this whole genre. It covers all the beats. It just kind of exposes all of the shitty cliches. And it does it so beautifully so perfectly that I really thought, I was like, oh, cool, this finally killed the genre. And then we had, I don't know, a dozen more, and they keep fucking winning Oscars. I guess why they do it, but Jesus Christ, man, they do the same thing. I, I just don't get it. I don't know why the fuck they're doing this. I hate it. If it's good, if it's a good movie, I can hold that entirely separate from the legacy of the man who was probably a piece of shit, Elvis. And I'm happy for everybody working on it. I love movies. Even if I hate the idea of the movie or the movie itself, I love them. I love movies, so I'm glad for everybody. I just don't understand why they keep doing these fucking biopics. Moving on. So I'm trying to stay away from bad news, but this is in the movie realm, and I have to cover it. Film legend Ray Liotta has passed away at 67 years old. It's a huge bummer. Um, I know growing up, I watched Goodfellas all of the time. He was so good in it. Um, just, he's in so much stuff. It's hard to, uh, to cover all of it, but Ray Liotta passed away at 67 years old. Rest in peace, my guy. All right. So now I'm moving into the top set. So if you read the, um, title of the episode, you know, it's called a maddening multiverse. And that's because we're going head to head on two different movies. And I know super topical multiverse of madness only came out four weeks ago. We're talking about it. So I want to talk about Multiverse of Madness versus Everything, Everywhere, All the Time. Okay, editor's note. Um, I talk about how much I like this movie, and I fucked up the name. It's called Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, not Everything, Everywhere, All the Time. So uh, forgive me for being a chode on that one. Okay, back to the show. Um, I want to talk about their similarities and which one I felt was significantly better than the other. So... I'll start with the one I like the least, and that is, drumroll please, 
Multiverse of Madness. Now, for anybody who lives under a rock, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness is about Doctor Strange, directed by Sam Raimi, starring Benedict Cumberbatch, Elizabeth Olsen, Chiwetel Ejiofor, Benedict Wan, uh, Soshitil Gomez, Michael Stilberg, I don't know who that is, and Rachel McAdam. I don't know how that Michael Stilberg guy got his name in there. He's also in the credits really early. It's weird. Anyway, it's made $811 million at the box office, making it another smash hit for Disney and Marvel. Um... And let's go into the synopsis. I'll try to do it spoiler-free, although it's made a billion dollars. Everyone's going to see it, has seen it. Um, Doctor Strange gets attacked by a monster and flies into a universe. And then we find out it's not our Doctor Strange. That Doctor Strange dies. Spoiler alert, it turns out it's Wanda trying to use the Darkhold to kidnap America Chavez to have her use her powers of punching from universe to universe to take Wanda into a new universe where she can kill a different Wanda steal the kids, and have the family she's always dreamed of. Now, uh, from the trailers, unfortunately, I felt they gave away a whole bunch, um, too much, and I thought the movie itself ended up kind of not living up to the hype of the trailers. I thought there wasn't enough new, exciting stuff outside of the trailers to really warrant it. All of the really interesting multiversal stuff kind of ended up in there, and I, (laughs) I had to deal with this on multiple occasions, because, okay, I'm going to give my recommendation. I don't like this movie. In fact, I really, really dislike this movie. I felt it was a little samey as far as stakes because we just had Spider-Man No Way Home. We just had Loki all dealing with basically a very similar storyline. Um, and I thought it was samey. I don't think Sam Raimi's style, though I like it, fits the Marvel Universe. It took me out of it a bit. Some of his purposeful camp and cheesiness just didn't sit right with me. And I had to deal with this over and over again. When I brought up this next point, I think that Wanda's turn was unearned. And I had multiple people tell me, oh, you don't get it. The dark cold turned her evil. I fucking get it. I know how the evil book works. That still doesn't mean that I can't think it's lazy because we had six, eight episodes, whatever, how many episodes it was of WandaVision, her dealing with her grief, her being bereft, then her being torn up by the fact that she didn't realize that she had accidentally used her powers for evil and taken over this town. Yes, we see her then with a dark hold. But the last thing we see her do on purpose, that's not a post credit scene, is her being kind of regretful for hurting other people in pursuit of her own wants. Then next thing we see, She says, fuck it, I'm going full evil, I'm killing everybody, I'm jumping universes, I'm going to kill one of myself, I'm going to kidnap these kids, and yes, I understand the book makes her evil. That is also lazy. To have, it's, maybe not lazy, lazy is not the best word, it's counterproductive. It felt like a waste of my time, it felt unearned for this character that we've seen in so many movies. Then, to have this whole show about her having this arc of coming to terms, just to make this 180 And the next time you see her, she's evil again. I don't think you have to dislike this movie. I don't think it's a bad movie. I just really don't like it. Part of the reason is, like I said, it feels samey. But even moreover is because two weeks before, I went to go see the next movie. And that's everything, everywhere, all at once. And all I got to say about that, just to start with, is... That's, that's what I call a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Everything, Everywhere, All at Once is a film directed by the Daniels, Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert. It came out March 11, 2022, starring Michelle Yeoh, Stephanie Su, Ki Hu Kwan, Jenny Slate, Harry Shum Jr., James Hong, and Jamie Lee Curtis. It's actually the return of uh, Ki Hu Kwan, who played Short Round in... Um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and he was in the Goonies, and then basically he took the next 37 years off because, in his own words, there wasn't roles for people like him. He didn't see roles for Asian men that were leads or something that he wanted to do, so he stepped away from from acting, and he was doing um, he was doing other stuff, and he, he was still working in the industry, but he wasn't acting, and he said that when he saw Crazy Rich Asians, it was like, oh man, okay, so they there it. it might be time for me to come back because there's things I want to do. He's phenomenal in this. You cannot tell this man took 40 years off. Anyway, so this movie is, I'll read the synopsis because I don't want to give too much away. Even after my review, I don't want to give too much away. Um, ugh, okay. <laughs> the synopsis gives too much away. So, <laughs> so the start of the film, it kind of seems like one of those A24 small family dramas. It's about uh, Michelle Yeoh's character. Her and her husband uh, are running... 
a laundromat that they live above and they're being audited by the IRS and Michelle Yeoh's estranged father has come to visit and he hasn't talked to her in years. So she's trying to throw a Chinese New Year's party to, to impress her dad while trying to get through their audit. And her daughter comes to visit and her daughter wants to introduce her girlfriend to the grandfather and the mom is stressed out about it. And all of this happens while they get called into the IRS office in Simi Valley. Shout out to Simi Valley. I did used to live there and I did hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very true. It I know that we've actually talked about this in previous episodes. I don't even know which one. Uh, they get called into the IRS office, during which her husband puts in a Bluetooth earpiece and suddenly starts talking entirely different, starts acting different, and instructs her to do some very odd things, put one shoe on the other foot and stick her tongue in the roof of her mouth, just do odd things, and that things would become clear. So while she's being audited, she does all this, and all of a sudden she's yanked into what seems to be another reality where her husband explains that a multi-dimensional, infinitely multi-dimensional evil being is chasing her down in hopes of attaining some unknown end. Sounds a little familiar, right? Well, well, then this is where the story kicks off, and I don't want to give too much more away from that as far as the story, but I got to tell you, it is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the style of it, the the wittiness, the way that he approaches characters, approaches action, it is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Not only does it then kick into this multidimensional, super awesome martial arts stuff. I got to say, um, shout out to the people who did the martial arts. It is called, the, they are called the Martial Club on YouTube. They have an excellent YouTube channel and that's how they got involved in this is through YouTube. And I think that was so cool. Uh, the budget on this movie was really um, low as far as these kind of pictures and they really stretched the budget. Everything was so awesome. Uh, it's actually A24's, I think, highest grossing film ever. It's getting a wide release, and I, I couldn't be more complimentary to this movie. Anyway, so this is where the martial arts and the interdimensional stuff kicks off, but they never lose that emotional heart of the small movie it starts with. The relationship between her and her husband and her father and her daughter is beautiful the whole time. Even when they're all switching through different universes, they have these different versions of the relationships that are all so deep and heartfelt in a way that I felt was missing from Multiverse of Madness. So I think had I not seen this movie, I would have maybe liked Multiverse more, but I I didn't. And I did see this movie and I loved it. Anyway, um, but one of the things they really lean into in a way that Multiverse of Madness didn't is the possibilities and the kind of absurdist, existentially daunting nature of the realization that when things are infinite, and the, in this movie they really do explore the infinite nature of it, nothing matters. And that's kind of the point of the movie. And it, it ends up leading to kind of a beautiful realization that because nothing matters at the end of the day, you can decide what matters, right? And that's kind of what the story culminates in, but just as a little microcosm of how weird things get uh, one of the way the way you can connect yourself closer to the consciousness of a version of you from a different universe is to do something very improbable. So, for instance, you know, to give yourself paper cuts between all of your fingers and then like lick the blood. Very improbable thing. But when you do that, it brings your consciousness closer in probability to the consciousness of a you from a different universe. And then they teach each other how to aim it. Uh, and then there's one scene where you know they have to collect. You can collect abilities from other versions of yourself. So everyone's going around doing the most absurd stuff. Some of the bad guys are fighting and they're putting staplers up their butts just because it's the the least likely thing they can do. (laughs) They're fighting to be able to put a stapler in their butt or uh, no, a trophy in his butt because it'd be the least likely thing to do in order to get closest to the most powerful version of himself. So it's weird. It's wild. There's a universe where there are rocks. There's a universe where there's just nothing. They turn into piñatas. And they did this on super low budget. Um, and it's just, it's amazing. I can't praise it enough. Go check it out. Go check it out. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Circling back to the kind of infinite absurdity of infinity, uh, one of the things that bothered me with um, Multiverse of Madness is that the stakes ended up being so low, to me at least, because there were so many. I mean, we see multiple versions of Doctor Strange die. We see the Illuminati die. We see all this stuff happen, and I think they kind of miscalculated that they're like, oh, well, the stakes are so high because there's one, there's a million of everybody. To me, that just feels like, well, nothing matters. Like we just saw it. Okay. If somebody, it happened, 
It happens in comic books all the time. Nobody stays dead, but it happened in Endgame, right? We lost Gamora in Infinity War, and by Endgame, they had a new Gamora. And the more you see it, kind of, for me, it feels like diminishing returns. Um, and one of the writers of the movie himself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read an excerpt from an article that was written about him on IGN, kind of summed it up in a way I don't think he realized he was doing, but in the inverse of what he meant. So this was um, director Michael Wall, sorry, Writer Michael Waldron, who worked on Loki, uh, is talking about Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, and he says that his time on Rick and Morty was excellent prep. He says, quote, It was perfect training ground because every week in that show we take a big sci-fi concept that you could probably write a movie about, and we basically blow it, blow it apart in the first five minutes of the show. Really, you've got to explain to an audience quickly and then just shift it into the background so they can get swept up in the adventure in the rest of what's a 22 minute episode. And so Rick and Morty trained me how to introduce these big sci-fi concepts in ways that were digestible, palatable to the audience and without getting them bogged down in boring details. So let's unpack that. I agree. Multiverse of Madness did do a great job of, of getting stuff set up and then kind of moving on. It didn't get too bogged down in the details, but I think what this writer missed is that Rick and Morty does that, right? They set up these high concepts and they tear them down, they move on. They do it for the comedy. They do it for the farce. They do that because the point of that show is that there are no stakes. Nothing matters. We don't even know which Rick and which Morty we're watching from week to week. They've di- we've seen them die dozens, hundreds, thousands of times when they exploded the, the uh, sanctum of Rick's. The point of that show is that nothing matters but what you choose. So when you apply that logic to a big budget action movie, um, big budget Marvel movie, where it's supposed to be high stakes you're actually shooting yourself in the foot because at least for me, I just check out. I'm like, well, we know we just go grab a different one of all these fucking guys. Right. So I felt like that kind of threw it through itself for a loop. And in the same vein, everything everywhere all at once leans more into the absurdity, leans more into the Rick and Morty style where the point of that movie is that nothing matters and there is no stakes. That's the point. So in that, the stakes matter again because the point is that there's no point. So you can stay on board with them, at least for me. So anyway, that is my maddening multiverse and why I think Disney and Marvel need to steer away from too much multiversal stuff. I think they're going towards the Secret War storyline where they've hinted at already where the incursions start to happen and universes fold in on each other and the heroes have to fight each other to save their universes. It's basically getting all your toys out and bashing them together. Yes, it can be badass, but I think it can also spell the end for the universe as far as the movies, because it gets harder and harder to care the more the stakes get elevated and then they drop again. Every story cannot be the end of the universe, the end of existence, because there's no, you you get, you get the danger fatigue, you get the fatigue of the stakes, right? Like at a certain point, if everything's the end of the world, then nothing matters. Hence my point before. So that's why, you know, I prefer smaller scale things. I'm looking forward to like how Spider-Man's going probably to be street level again, just living his life fighting bad guys. I think there's a lot to be said for those kinds of adventures, especially for those kinds of characters. Thor does need to be off in space and blowing shit up because that's the kind of character, but not everybody needs to be the end of the world. (sighs) So that's the end of that rant. Anyway, Tyler, what did you think about it? Yeah. Gotcha. So that would be a great example for listeners, what I mentioned at the beginning. I did. I did. It's in. <laughs> so, <laughs> jokes. <laughs> Hilarious again, my man. You never cease to, to amaze me. All right, moving on to what we're watching. Uh, the last thing I watched, almost in its completion, I've been very, very busy the past, uh, what is it, May 28th? Five months and 28 days, so it's been very hard for me to get a good amount of sleep and get stuff done. So I watched 90% of Chippendale Rescue Rangers before falling asleep by accident. <laughs> and I got to say, it was wonderful. Uh, if you didn't watch the show, it's about two little chipmunks. One's dressed like Magnum P.I., one's dressed like Indiana Jones, and they go on adventures and they rescue stuff. Now, this movie was uh, written and directed by The Lonely Island, and it stars John Mulaney and Andy Samberg. So come on, that sounds great already, doesn't it? And these guys did something I really love, and it's that doing something new, take a swing. So instead of this just being a movie version of the cartoon, this takes place in kind of a Roger Rabbit style world where the cartoons live in the real world. They are actors in their own show, 
and they had a falling out in 1992, and now 30-ish years later, they get called in by one of their co-stars who has a drug issue, and he's his drug of choice is stinky cheese. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I'm a trouble guy. I need some money. I think they're going to hurt me. Then he goes up missing, and then guess what? The rescue rangers have to reunite to rescue their friend. And it was cute. It was filled with awesome cameos. My favorite one by far is uh, Tim Robinson from I Think You Should Leave. Who Anybody who knows me, it's my favorite show. <laughs> he plays Ugly Sonic from the first Sonic trailers, and he's like this washed up actor who got fired from his movie. It's it's hilarious. So I would definitely recommend that. It's on Disney Plus it's streaming right now. Go check it out. Uh, the next thing I'm watching is I'm on episode whatever last episode of Moon Knight is. I've been on it for <laughs> a few weeks. I'm finally have the time today after this next leg workout where I'm hitting next. Ooh, actually, before I say another word. Shake up my pre-workout because I'm going to hit legs right after this. But after that, I'm going to finish the last episode of Moon Knight. And I'm excited. Uh, this won't be my full review, but I got to say I was a little disappointed with Moon Knight. I just thought it kind of meandered. I thought it lost a lot of opportunity. Um, the writing and execution, just it wasn't it for me. Again, super happy it got made. I love Oscar Isaac. He's a Guatemalan actor. I think he's Guatemalan and Puerto Rican. Anyway, he's he's one of my uh, Latino familia, and I'm very happy to see him succeed. He's a huge actor. Happy to see him in this. He's not playing a Latino character, so that's kind of a bummer. Um, but So I was really wanting a lot out of this show, and it disappointed me. Maybe the last episode will pick it up. Um, did love the costume, though. But anyway, so I'm, I'm finishing that up later today. Um, I've been recommended by my brother, Outer Range and Tokyo Vice, so I really want to get a chance to start watching those. I really don't think I ever will get to them, but if you hear this now, Dom, I'm, I want to. I promise I want to watch it. <laughs> um, tonight, I might, if given the chance, check out the movie X. I think it's streaming on uh, Amazon. It's about a group of pornographers in the 1970s who go to a remote woods location to film a film, <laughs> to film an adult film, and are attacked by a slasher. It looks cool. I love horror movies. I love slashers. Um, I love... Kid Cudi, who doesn't? He's in this movie. Uh, Jenna Ortega's in it. Should be fun. I think it's got good reviews, so I'm going to try to check that out. And then I really want to see Men. It's the new Alex Garland movie who directed Ex Machina and Annihilation. Uh, It looks cool. It's about this woman who, after the apparent suicide of her husband, goes to a remote English countryside to just get away and kind of take stock of her life. And she feels like she's being stalked by a man and everybody in the town is has the same exact face. It's super creepy, super off-putting. I don't want to know more of the story than that until I see it. So that's what I'm going to be checking out, and uh, and I'll review them after I watch them. What about you, LT Gray? What you checking out? Oh, man, same things as last week with Minx, Tournament of Champions, uh, Restaurant Impossible is that random thing that we're just binge-watching now. Mentioned Better Call Saul, Better Call Saul 5, and I just randomly put on over the weekend just when I was watching TV, I was watching a very random movie. Was the was that movie the How the West Was Won and the Mustache Song? And all of a sudden, we start to see the cameras moving, going to each character. Is this where it happens? We're all kind of waiting. When is the murdering going to start? Um, I would say that the they tried to put in more deeper cuts there. Like I meant, I just kind of talked about the underlying discussion of him retiring. Um, there's a couple hints, and finally, after an hour, we get to the killing after spending all this other time. I don't even know what they're doing in the movie, to be honest. I'm like thinking about it now. It's a whole hour, but you're like, holy crap. Like, why has anybody been shot yet? (laughs) Taking that into uh, 2022, that's what do what they do. That I forgot. Maybe it was, um, I think it might've been Matt Reeves talking about uh, glasses and how they scrub stuff out. No, I think it was, um, uh, no, no, no. It was a, All right, I guess it's time to drop the farce a little bit. Tyler's obviously not actually here. Jokes, 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 jokes. jokes. He is in, I believe, Columbus, Ohio, competing in a Highland Game event, a charity event for Wounded Warriors. So kudos to El Tigre for that. I miss you, man. Hope the comp went well. Um, Yeah, but I want to jump into this episode um, because it actually will tie into our cool down and post-workout takeaway I've been feeling a little stuck lately, you know, with uh, acting, and unfortunately, you kind of have to wait for people to let you do it, because you got to get cast, you you got to get on set, you got to wait for post-production to even see the goddamn thing, 
And one of the things that bugs me about creative people is they love to take a fucking long time between doing things. And it pisses me off because I, if I don't do it now, I won't do it. And I hate waiting. Anyway, so my takeaway as far as feeling stuck and then jumping in to make this episode so I can make something, my takeaway is that you need to take a look at if what you're doing is consistent with who you want to be and who you tell yourself that you are. Because if not, you're going to get into some trouble. So what I mean by that, uh, and like I said, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I've been guilty of it for a long time, is that if you want to be that guy, then you have to fucking be that guy every day from when you wake up till you go to sleep. It's not enough to want it or to talk about it or to dream it or wish it. You have to live it. There's absolutely no time left in any of our lives. We, we don't know how much time is left. So just assume there's none. There's no time left to wait to be the person that you want to be or the person you want to be seen as. If you want to be a good person or just a better friend or a better husband or better wife or whatever the fuck, then you just have to do it. You have to do the work. You have to show up every single day. You have to show up for people, for the people that matter to you. You have to show up even when it's not comfortable, even when it's inconvenient, even when it hurts. You have to, if that's who you want to be, then you have to show up. I was um, was at a, a funeral service for a, a good friend's father. And one of the guys sitting there asked, you know, what's the, the best life advice you've ever given or what's the best motto you live by? And uh, I was saying that that um, best advice I've ever been given is that to live your life like you're currently filming the documentary of your life, right? Behave the way that you would want to be seen in the movie about your life. Don't be fucking Elvis. Don't wait for the revisionist history to turn you into the person you always thought you were, right? You have to do it. And that's the way that I try to live my life, especially now as I'm getting older and I I have these realizations because there's a certain kind of person that I want to be and that's why I show up and that's why I'm making this fucking episode because I want to be somebody who makes things and is creative and sitting on my ass and being upset that shoots get pushed doesn't help that. So here the fuck I am. So I don't know if this takeaway will resonate with you, but I hope it does. Because at the end of the day, if what you're doing and who you want to be don't line up, you're going to end up pretty fucked up. People who live like that, that's where you end up noticing that you fill all of your spare time with going out and drinking or partying. And not for the fun of it, it's to ignore the fact or avoid the fact that maybe you aren't who you want to be. And in those quiet moments is where that confronts us. So to all my friends out there, to all my, uh, all of our true believers, all our movie buff friends, take a look. You might not like what you see, but you can start changing it right now. So that was my rant, uh, my long takeaway. And uh, that's it. (laughs) So thank you everybody for listening and watching me talk my shit again. I appreciate it, taking this 40-something minutes out of your day. You could have been absolutely anywhere in the world, and maybe you are. But no matter where you are, you were here with me, and I really appreciate that. If you don't already, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram at moviebuffs underscore podcast. Leave us a five-star review. Send this to somebody. Fucking airdrop the file to everybody in line at Costco. I don't give a shit. Help me spread the podcast. Let's get some ears on this thing because, you know, if not, I'm just screaming into the black mirror that is my computer screen. I appreciate your time. I wish you all the best. Tune in next week when we go over our favorite Tom Cruise performances and antics and review Top Gun, or maybe we just say fuck it and film ourselves breathing heavily into the mic for 90 minutes. You'll have to tune in next week and see. All right, everybody. Bye. Stay buff. No, okay, let's try it again. You might have to tune in next, or whatever. You'll have to tune in next week and see. All right, everybody. Stay buff, my friends. Bye. Inspired by hosts Ron and Tyler to work on your health? The Movie Buffs podcast is brought to you by Time to Train Fitness. Use the link in the description to view all of the membership options and to start a free five day trial. Get ready to press play on your next workout.